So in the first part uh, of this handout, um, I was trying to explain to you why uh, substantive universals, right? These universals that have the form uh, every language has this thing or no language has this thing, um, why they're uh, not very interesting for linguistic theory, right? And part of the reason is because there just aren't that many substantive universals. And the ones that exist are really sort of like trivial things, like every language has stops or every language has vowels um, that don't really teach us uh, much about the details of phonological systems. Um, so what would be an interesting universal? Well, here's a couple examples. One of them relates back to the example we just looked at um, about so-called vertical vowel systems, right? And so we were looking at the vowel quadrilateral here. Um, and if you just look at the inventories in this UPSID database, you might think that uh, every language has at least one front vowel and at least one back vowel or something like that. Um, but what I mentioned there was that, well, that's, that's only true at a sort of surface level of analysis. If you look at underlying representations in lexical contrast, there's actually several languages that have only central vowels. Um, <clears throat> something like a low central, mid central, and high central vowel. Um, it's just that when they're produced in context with consonants, there's often allophonic variation that makes them sound front or back on the surface. Um, and so even this generalization that every language has a back and a front vowel um, is not entirely interesting because it doesn't actually reflect the facts of phonological contrast uh, in numerous languages. Um, here's an interesting generalization that, that does take these accounts into effect. Uh, in languages with any kind of a backness contrast, having one of these central vowels implies that that language also has a front and a back vowel as well. Right? So if you have any kind of a vowel backness contrast, uh, then if you have a central vowel, you'll always have at least one front and back vowel. Right, so that's a much more complicated kind of a generalization. Uh, but in vertical vowel systems of this type, uh, <clears throat> central vowels are perfectly happy to exist without having front or back counterparts, uh, at least in terms of lexically stored features. Right? There's often allophonic variants uh, that are front or back. Um, but underlyingly, it looks like this is actually a perfectly fine kind of a vowel system. We find it in Marshallese and Kabardian and a number of other languages. Um, so that's uh, an interesting generalization. It's a more correct generalization or more complete generalization than the one that we got from looking at UPSID, but it's also a fair bit more complicated. Um, here's another interesting generalization that we've sort of hinted at in this class, but not uh, quite talked about explicitly. Uh, every language with voiced obstruents also allows voiceless obstruents but not vice versa. So that not vice versa part is important here. It means that this is an asymmetrical uh, because there perfectly well can be languages that have voiceless obstruents but no voiced ones, uh, as in Maori, which we looked at in this class, um, as well as many other languages in the world. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be any language, at least not amongst the languages we've seen, uh, that has voiced obstruents but lacks voiceless ones. Hmm. So that's kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is a little bit different than the generalization that every language has voiceless obstruents. It's not clear um, exactly what we conclude about that for phonological theory. Uh, this generalization about the relationship between voiced and voiceless obstruents, this is going to be uh, more interesting in terms of what our theory says. Um, and all these generalizations, the, the last two or three that we looked at here, these are no longer substantive universals at this point. They're now implicational universals. Right? Um, they're implications because it says, hey, if a language has this thing, then it also has this thing, but that doesn't work in the other direction or something like that. Um, and uh, unlike uh, substantive universals, uh, these are much more common uh, in what we know about the world's languages. There's all sorts of implicational universals that appear to hold in uh, just about all or maybe completely all of the languages that have ever been studied by phonologists. You can find lots and lots of implicational universals uh, and that 
in part sets them apart from substantive universals. Also, unlike substantive universals, these implicational universals have actually played a large role in developing linguistic theory. Um, and this is part of the reason why I chose to introduce OT in this class, right? So even though optimality theory is pretty complicated and it involves a lot of sort of uh, detailed uh, formal mechanisms, uh, unlike the rule-based approach, uh, OT is perfectly tailored to deal with implicational universals. In fact, that's one of the reasons why optimality theory was developed in the first place, was precisely to have some kind of a theory that could address these implicational universals because they appear to exist all over the place and there's no way to deal with this uh, in tr more traditional rule-based phonology uh, because really there's no theory of cross-linguistic variation in that theory. Um, how does OT deal with these kinds of generalizations? Well, constraints are viable. So even the most marked thing in the world could occur in some language if faithfulness is high ranked enough. Um, and because of that reason, we predict very, very few substantive universals. There shouldn't be that many substantive universals in a theory where every constraint is potentially violated. Uh, but the fundamental asymmetries in what kinds of markedness constraints exist uh, naturally predict implicational universals. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, one of the examples we saw earlier in this class was the constraint um, against uh, non-anterior coronal, uh, no, excuse me, this one will be against uh, anterior coronal uh, <clears throat> fricatives. So uh, this is a constraint against anterior coronal uh, obstruent continuance uh, preceding a high front vowel so plus i minus back plus syllabic and i've been abbreviating this uh, as star c just because it's easier than writing all these features in um, and uh, we saw lots of evidence for this constraint but we didn't posit a constraint star she so this one with the minus anterior value in this particular matrix, this doesn't seem to exist at all, right? That's just not present in the world's languages. Um, and that already predicts uh, some fundamental uh, implicational universals um, because uh, in any language where we have an esh uh, and, a, and a su sound, right? so any language that has both the plus anterior and the minus anterior versions of these fricatives, is necessarily a language um, where the relevant faithfulness constraint, let's say it's a dent anterior, uh, is going to be ranked above uh, general context free markedness of esh, right? So this one should be uh, the full statement of this would be. Uh, star minus anterior plus coronal minus center minus continuant. If we find an esh somewhere in a language, right, then this must be ranked below this. Otherwise, you would change its anteriority values. Uh, and once you have that, because there's no special constraint star she, uh, then any language like this is also going to allow she to surface faithfully. Right? There's actually no particular reason to change the anteriority features here. Um, uh, because again, neither of these constraints even mentions uh, the vowel. Uh, but if you allow st uh, C, we now know something else about this language. Uh, namely, the constraint star C, oops, excuse me, that's wrong, uh, must be ranked below faithfulness as well. Excuse me, that's, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if we know that this is the winner uh, and that this surfaces faithfully, 
uh, then we also know that this constraint is low ranked, at least ranked below faithfulness. Um, and so uh, any language that allows this is also going to allow this high ranked faithfulness. Um, <clears throat> as long as there's some esh that surfaces somewhere in the language. That's how we inferred this ranking. If there's an esh somewhere that should be allowed here, uh, versus su, as we saw in class, just because there's a su in some other context doesn't mean that su will be allowed to surface here. That depends on the ranking of this uh, context-specific faithfulness constraint. Right? So there's an implicational universal here for every language that has anterior and non-anterior fricatives somewhere in the language, uh, if it allows C to surface, then it will also allow she to surface, but not vice versa. We saw several languages that allow she to surface, but don't let uh, C surface, and that's because this constraint exists, but this other hypothetical star she constraint doesn't exist, right? So just having some markedness constraints and not having others already predicts implicational universals. Uh, similarly, for several of the languages that we looked at in class, well, notably Maori, we had to have a constraint that said, don't have voice obstruents. But we haven't seen any language that calls for a constraint, don't have voiceless obstruents. So again, if star duh exists, right, where this is going to be any voiced obstruent, and I'm going to call this one uh, star D, just as an abbreviation, uh, if this exists but star T with the minus voice feature doesn't, right, uh, then having voiced obstruents in a language implies, again, implicational universals, that you'll also have voiceless ones, but not vice versa. Right? Why is that? Well, if you allow duh to surface faithfully, uh, then it follows that uh, faithfulness to voicing must be ranked above the markedness constraint on voiced obstruents. Uh, <clears throat> so we know that this is the winner, therefore this better be high ranked, this better be lower ranked. In this language, uh, ta is always going to surface faithfully as well because there is no special constraint against voiceless obstruents. In fact, this candidate is completely unmarked. But the opposite is not true, because if you flipped this ranking, right, then we would predict both of these would neutralize to the voiceless obstruent ta. Um, so again, just the fact that this constraint exists, but star t doesn't exist, uh, predicts implicational asymmetries, implicational universals. Um, and this one, at least, uh, appears to be a correct one. So if faithfulness is high ranked enough in some language to allow the marked structure, then it's necessarily also going to be high ranked enough to allow the unmarked structure um, in each of these languages. Um, and in particular, there's no pressure to change the unmarked structure, the voiceless stop in this case, uh, because there's no constraint against it whatsoever. That's a little bit different than the C-She case, where we did see that there are languages that don't have any strident fricatives at all. So there's going to be some markedness constraint that says don't have s or sh in your language. Um, that's why we had to start with this uh, proviso that any language that has the relevant sounds will obey the implicational asymmetry. Because right? there are some languages that just don't have strident fricatives at all, again, like Maori. <clears throat>